Uh, as I mentioned this morning, uh, Steve's father, William Harold Tidings, passed away this week, age 89. Steve and Sue will be leaving Wednesday to drive to Oklahoma to be with their family and uh, uh, participate in his uh, memorial service. And Lewis has the songs, and Steve has our opening prayer this evening. Closing. Charlie's got opening. Charlie's, Charlie's is opening. Yeah, the opening. You got closing. Good evening again. <laughs> Dave is not leading songs this evening, <laughs> but he's passing out papers. Another skill that he's acquired. <laughs> I love this guy. 634, 634. What you guys laughing at? <laughs> well, we'll work till Jesus comes. <clears throat> oh, land of rest for the outside wind will the morning come when I shall lay my armor down and dwell in peace at home. We'll work till Jesus comes.
just wanted to give you guys an example of uh, what I usually talk about when I say how, you know, what great of a singer I am. I wanted you to be able to see for yourselves firsthand. <laughs> Russ, you missed it. You weren't here. I sang a stanza from the pulpit this morning. And uh, yeah, Cri Christy and Diane are up front laughing. I'm like, what's, you know. So eventually I just started going like this because. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So I passed out a couple uh, pieces of paper. I told you each Sunday night we're going to do something a little bit different. Sometimes we're going to have a little bit of video snippets along with a uh, Bible study. Sometimes we're going to do a Q&A. Uh, and this kind of Q&A actually comes to us because uh, look, we're not going to probably do the abortion one tonight. I printed that just because, uh, I don't know if you guys have watched the news or anything, but something uh, significant had happened with uh, Roe vs. Wade. And so I, I printed this out because I'm often surprised how little... Uh, members of the church know about what it actually says in the Bible in regards to the topic of abortion. So I printed this out. Don't think we'll actually use it for tonight, but if you want to do it next week, we can. But I printed it out more for your sake, for you to take home, and you can share that information with others. And it's not even the complete study. It's just uh, something to give us some uh, information. But if you look at the other page, morality, where it says morality, uh, that side, question. Can a good moral person be saved without Jesus? That's where we're going to start here tonight. We're going to look to answer that question. But then on the opposite side, we're going to follow that up with, uh, is it arrogant to say that Jesus is the only way to eternal life? Because there are those that would say it's pretty arrogant to say there's only one way to salvation. There's only one way. And so we're going to look at maybe that question here tonight as well. So let's get started tonight in the book of Acts. If we can open up our Bibles to Acts. Because as we look at this, I want, I want us to really understand what the scriptures have to say. Because this is a common misconception that people have inside the church and outside the church. And so I've had this conversation with many people over the years. And I want us to look at uh, Acts chapter 10 and verse 22. Because looking at the handout, it says, Cornelius was not only a good moral person. Uh, well, okay, it, many of us know who Cornelius is in Acts chapter 10. But have you really ever stopped and looked at it through the eyes of, can a good moral person be saved outside of Jesus? And I want us to look at a couple good moral people that the scriptures speak of and ask yourself, were they saved outside of Christ, being a good moral person? And so we look at Acts chapter 10 and verse 22, and I want us to see what it says there. Acts chapter 10, verse 22, notice what it says. And they said, Cornelius, a centurion, a righteous man, what did I call him, a righteous man, right? A good moral person, a righteous individual, God-fearing man, well-spoken by the entire nation of the Jews, was divinely directed by a holy angel to send for you and to come to, to, come to his house and hear a message from you. So when you look at Acts chapter 10 and verse 22, what do we, just, what's the little bit we learn about Cornelius there? We learn that he's a, a, a good and righteous and moral person. And I'm going to preface this uh, study as we go through this. This isn't a sermon. should have said it before I started. I have to try to get in the flow of doing that again. Uh, worship service is not over. We're going to enter into a Bible study. We'll offer an invitation at the end. But this is going to be a Bible study. So uh, I know we don't have any visitors here. But that way, if there was women speaking, it's not a sermon uh, and not the, the, not the worship service that we're speaking in. So um, did I see a hand? Yeah. I think he was not only a good person, but he cared about reaching out for others and helping others. And yes. Being involved with others and providing for people, the, the Jews especially. Amen. Absolutely. So you look at Cornelius. He was a good, moral, righteous individual. He was a benevolent individual. He helped uh, the Jewish people greatly, and we'll look at that here in a second. So now I want us to stay in Acts chapter 10, but look at verse 2 now. When you go to back to the beginning of the chapter, actually, let's just look at verse 1, 1 and 2. Now, there was a certain man at Caesarea named Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian cohort, a devout man and one who feared God with all his household and gave many alms to the Jewish people and prayed to God continuously. So remember, the question is, can a, more, a good moral person be saved outside of Jesus. Well, here in Scripture, we have an example of a good, moral, righteous, benevolent individual. And the question I would ask you is, outside of Jesus Christ, was he saved? And that's the question that we have to look to answer. And so, 
I want us to now stay in Acts and flip forward to Acts chapter 11. And we look at verse 13 and 14. Because apart from becoming a Christian, this good, moral, and benevolent individual was not saved. How do I, how do I know that? And is it arrogant for me to say something like that? And that's why we look to Scripture for all, uh, all the information that we need. In Acts chapter 11, in verse 13 and 14, notice what it says there. And he reported to us how he had seen an angel standing in his house and saying, Send to Joppa and have Simon, who is called Peter, brought here. And he shall speak words to you by which you will be saved, you and all your household. So you look at Cornelius, and I ask the simple question, based on these few verses that we looked at. We've learned that he's a good moral individual. We learned that he's benevolent, right? And that he does much to help the household of the Jews, right? But then you look at uh, Acts chapter 11, and verse 13 and 14, and the angel's telling Simon and Peter that he needs to go. And then when he gets there, he tells them all the words in which they need to be saved by. So if he needs to be saved, is he already saved? And if he was to die before coming to the knowledge of that truth, would he then be saved? Because remember, we're in the Christian era here. The church has already started. At this point, by Acts chapter 11, the church has been going on for over 10 years. So can somebody be saved outside of Christ? And the answer is no. But people will always say, but what about those people in some third world country that maybe never heard of Jesus? And th this comes up all the time. And I simply ask the question, does the Bible say that we are all sinners in need of a Savior? Yes. Even those people that maybe never heard of Jesus? What is the only way we could atone for any sin? The blood of Jesus Christ. The blood of Jesus Christ. Now, is that for a multitude of sins or just even one sin? So is it just one sin that separates us from God, or is it many sins that separate us from God? You see, we live in the Christian era, and everybody that has lived post-cross lives in the Christian era. And if you live in the Christian era, we are found, we, we know that in Romans chapter 3, Romans chapter 4, we know that it tells us that we have all been found guilty, both Jews and Gentiles alike. And so what is the only way that we can be saved? It's through the message and through being obedient to the message. Faith comes from hearing, hearing by the word of God, Romans 10 and 17, amen? Mm -hmm. And so if you look at that, is that example clear? He was devout, he was righteous, he was benevolent, and yet he was not saved. Because he and his whole household had to be told what he must do to be saved. Make sense? Yeah. Any thoughts or questions? Romans chapter 1 tells us we are without excuse because since the creation of the world is his eternal power and his divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood to what has been made, so yep. that they are without excuse. Yeah. And the attributes and the majesty of God is evident around us everywhere. And Randy's reading in Romans chapter 1, that's starting in about verse 18 through about 20. Yeah, 18 through 20. Yep. Russ, I see in your hand. Yeah, I think uh, even the word devout, they describe Cornelius as devout, which suggests to us that he studied some kind of religious writing, probably yeah. the Torah. Yeah. But uh, most people in the world would say that man is saved. Yeah. He's good. He's, he's a good, wholesome he's a man. He's a devout person. He studies scripture. Yep. Um, and okay. so they would, most people would just say that man is saved. Yeah. Like, Amen. Except Peter, Absolutely. of course. Yes. Peter would just. I was at a, doing a Bible study in Pittsburgh with a family, and the father was in the living room, and I was studying with one of the relatives in the dining room with another person. And we got to the point about who was saved. And all we can be saved. And he got up and came out of the living room and said, you mean to tell me the lady next door who feeds those poor people and do all these good things, she's not going to heaven? I said, well, just do what the Lord says. He said, no, she's a good person. And he had us stop the study and stop that family from studying. Mm -hmm. And we never got to go there. But the fact of the matter is that can destroy any yeah. thing if we don't have an understanding. And so you see the reason why I picked this question to begin with, because the question is, can a good moral person be saved outside of Jesus? And the answer that you just seen was no. So we look at another example. Um, how about Saul of Tarsus? We're going to look at uh, staying in the book of Acts. Let's flip forward to Acts chapter 23. 
And as you look at Acts chapter 23, I want you to see what the scriptures say about Saul of Tarsus. We know that uh, he did some things that were questionable in, in the eyes, through the eyes of our, our Christian eyes. But when you look at what the scripture says about him, was he a devout uh, follower of God? Let's see what the scriptures say. Acts chapter 23, and you look at verse, uh, what am I at here? Acts chapter 23 and verse 1. And it says, And Paul, looking intently at the council, said, Brethren, I have lived my life with a perfect, uh, I have lived my life with a perfectly good conscience before God up until this day. Was the Apostle Paul, when he was speaking, was he not being led by the Holy Spirit of God? Amen. So is that a false statement to say that he wasn't uh, living uh, before God with a perfect, perfect conscience up until that day? It's not to say that he was a perfect, un sinless individual, but that even no, no matter if he had transgression, he made the necessary sacrifices. He made the necessary atonement in order to atone for his sin under Judaism. And then I look at uh, the next passage I want you to see is in, uh, in regards to Saul of Tarsus. I want you to look at Galatians chapter 1 and verse 14. So as we flip over to Galatians chapter 1 and we look at verse 14, I want you to notice what it says here about Paul or Saul. Galatians chapter 1 verse 14. Notice what it says here. And I was, I, and I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries, among my countrymen, being more extremely zealous for my ancestral traditions. Well, what is the scriptures telling us here about young Saul and goes on to be the Apostle Paul? At the time he was Saul, was he considered a devout man of God? And as the time that he was Saul, does it say here in this verse that he says, I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries. He was an up-and-coming Pharisee. He would eventually, if he stayed in Judaism, probably maybe would have been in line for, a potential, uh, for the high priesthood, potentially. Uh, but either way, he would have been somebody that was in high standing. Was he a man of God? And the answer is yes. But we also know that when we look at his story, uh, was he saved at that point? What did, the, what did Saul of Tarsus have to do? Uh, remember when uh, he met Jesus on the road to Damascus? And Jesus said, you need to go and stay in the house and that it'll be told what you must do, right? And then in Acts 21, Acts chapter 22, he's giving an account of his conversion. And it was Ananias said to him, why do you delay? Arise and be baptized, washing away your sins. And we know that baptism, it tells us in the, in the, in the book of Peter, in the, letter, the writings of Peter, that we are saved in baptism. We know that those who were saved in Acts chapter 2, right? Starting in verse 41, it speaks of those. Those who were hearing the word of God and, uh, uh, and those who were being repenting and being baptized, they were saved. God was adding them to the kingdom, we learn in verse 47. So the point was, Saul of Tarsus, if he were to remain being that devout and, and, and a righteous individual that was more zealous than his contemporaries, was he saved because of that, or was he not? Well, he answers that in the very next verse. Yeah. Verse 15. Go ahead and read that one. He uses the word but, so there's an exception yep. here. But when God, who had set me apart even from my mother's womb and called me through his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me so that I might preach him among the Gentiles. Yep. And so you look at these verses here. And the question was, can a good moral person be saved outside of Christ? So I want you to take these examples that I'm giving you here tonight, and then the next one uh, that we want to look at is also in the book of Acts. Let's go backward to the book of Acts, uh, Acts chapter 8. So going back to Acts, and we're going to look at Acts chapter 8. We're going to look at the Ethiopian eunuch, because I want to see if this was an individual that was thought of to be devout and righteous. Acts chapter 8, verse 27 and verse 28. Notice what it says here. And he arose and went, and behold, there was an Ethiop Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasury. And he had come to Jerusalem to worship. And he was returning and sitting in the chariot and was reading the prophet Isaiah. So you know that this Ethiopian eunuch, who was a court official of, of the queen of Ethiopia, 
uh, was he, would he have been considered devout? Rem Do you guys know how far it was for, to travel from Ethiopia to Jerusalem? I think when I, yeah, when I looked it up, it was like 15 or 1,600 miles. Can you imagine going 15 or 1,600 miles being pulled by like a donkey or a camel? You know what I mean? You're, you're, you're not walking with any type of urgency. You're, you're just moseying down the road. It would have taken months, months to get back home. Right? But the point is, not that, the point is, was, would he be considered devout? Yes. And was he considered a, a, a follower of God? And was he saved? And the answer is no. How do we know that? Because if you go and you read the rest of his story, um, who was it? The Philip that had to run up and chase down the chariot. And he says, do you understand what you're reading? He says, how can I unless somebody explains it to me? And from that scripture in Isaiah 53 where he was at, he began to preach Jesus to him. And, at, and then it goes on, and he never mentions baptism, but then he says, well, what hinders me from being baptized? It doesn't say they ever talked about baptism, but obviously they did, because he says, well, what hinders me from being baptized? And he says, well, nothing, if you believe with all your heart. I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And they stopped the chariot and went down into the water. Yes? He went to Jerusalem to worship. Yeah. What was he worshiping in Jerusalem? Absolutely, absolutely. And so because he was worshiping God... And just like Cornelius was worshiping, did that mean that they were in a safe state? And the answer is no. So you look at these biblical examples, right? But then you say, you know, like I said, you're having uh, the Bible study, but, but you're saying that Mrs. Jones next door, who does all these wonderful things for the, the people in the neighborhood, she's not saved? Well, if we remove the emotion from it, and we allow the scriptures to speak for itself, does God give us the blueprint of salvation? Does he tell us what we need to do and how to do it in order to be saved? And so that's like this morning when I was talking about, I'll get to you in one second. That's why this morning when I was talking about in regards to, um, you know, I wanted to make sure and clarify who we were talking about in regards to the disfellowship. It wasn't talking about uh, people of other religions. It wasn't talking about people that were denominational Christians because these are individuals who haven't even come to the knowledge of the truth yet. And so you can't disfellowship somebody who's not even a member of the church to begin with. You can't disfellowship somebody you have no fellowship with. Does that make sense, Stephen? How do you diffuse the emotion of the conversation, Mike? Because I've been in those Bible studies before. Where you mean my, my congregation is going to hell because we have an organ in our music? What's a good way to diffuse uh, our, so that you get them back into the scripture? A, a, a good way to simply diffuse the situation is to continue to study to show yourself approved. I know that is a very basic answer. But if you guys look at the very beginning of my Bible, and it's starting to fall apart here at the same point, I have so many different topics, and they're highlighted, and it has all the scripture references on a myriad of different topics. Uh, if you've done any type of Bible study or have had uh, conversations about just Christianity with various people, uh, Russ, I know you have quite a few. Do similar questions seem to come up? Uh, when you have different conversations with different people, there's, there's, there's a certain set of questions that seem to, to arise on a regular basis. And I would encourage you to then know what those questions are about various topics. The, this question here, can a, just any good moral person make it into heaven? Or do you need to be washed in the blood of Christ, right? Is it arrogant for Jesus to say that I'm the only way, uh, uh, that no one can come unto the Father except through me? Is that arrogant for him to say that or for us to teach that? And so you need to really understand what are some of the common questions that are going to arise out of a variety of different topics and have ready answers available for you in your Bible. Most of us have smartphones. In my notes sections, I have, I have a bunch of different topics. I think I've emailed it to some of you where you could just pull it up. And if you just have your phone on you, you can say, what does the Bible say about this? And, oh, here's a you know, half dozen passages of Scripture then you could talk to them about what the scriptures say on any given topic, right? And that's something that me and Gina were talking about after worship this morning in regards to purgatory. Uh, she was having a conversation with a family member, and, and the purgatory came up, and then they made a comment about being refined with fire, and, and she was just saying, like, you know, how do we respond to certain things? And so, it, once again, that's a question with our backgrounds, and both of us, you know what I mean, with, you know, having many 
Catholic family members, if we then make those notes in our Bibles, put them in our smartphones, that way we have these conversations and say, you know, that's a, that's a good question. And they say, as I was studying this out, and then you could pull it up, and you could have all that information right there. So now it's not Stephen or Gina's opinion or David's opinion. This is literally what the Holy Scriptures say. Oh, I thought you were going to... Uh, Charles, did I see your hand? Yeah. Uh, there was a couple that started coming to church where I preached many years ago, and I went and had a study with them. And he, he had already been baptized. But she was not a member. She had of a denomination. And she said, but my body... I showed her what it said about baptism, and she said, yes, but my Bible class teacher is the most righteous man I ever met in my life, and blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. And I said, you leave him to God, what does this say to you? Then you can talk to him. Mm -hmm. And uh, she, was, she and her two daughters were baptized that night. Wow. Yeah, I love that. Barb? I think you kind of hit the nail on the head for Stephen's question, though. You have to take the, well, I think, out of it yeah. and go back to the, well, let's see what the Bible says about yeah. that. Let's just leave that's it right. there. Yeah. And, and that's something I've, I've said so many times, and not just myself, many people in this room and other people have said, is that we need to, whenever you have Bible-based uh, conversations, either your smartphone app or a hard copy of the Bible, if you have one or the other, open it up. And then, like I said, if you have those notes in the front or if you have them in your notes section on your cell phone, then you can pull it up and you, most of us have a Bible app. Just say, hey, you know, based on what you're saying, I, I want you to read right here what it says and fill out the blank, right? First Corinthians or Romans or Acts. Or, and then they can read it and they say, hmm. And what you're going to find is, and this is what I found, when you have these conversations with these different individuals, they'll say, oh, I've never seen that verse before. And they'll say, I don't believe that. And then, which is the very next question should be out, out of your mouth is, do you believe that this is the inspired word of God? If you believe that this book, the New Testament, is the complete revelation of God for New Testament Christianity and how we are to be saved, then if you don't believe that, then you, you kind of have a problem with your faith then. Because it's not us that are uh, trying to trick you somehow, this is literally what the Word of God says. Russ? Oh, uh, Ken? To me, it seems a little bit troubling mm -hmm. because my parents were Catholic. Yep. And they're past. So, what... I mean, they're not going to be in heaven. So, how can I be comforted in heaven Without that. Well, I look at that question. That you're not the first one that raises that question. Because most of my family is, this, is in the same boat. And, well, pretty much all of my deceased members of my family are in that boat. And so, at the end of the day, when we ask the question, you know, how are we to handle the, uh, the emotional side of it, okay? I simply go back to Scripture. And I show them that what the Scriptures have to say on any given topic... And then when it comes to the death of individuals, I would ask myself, um, would my, if my deceased relatives are not in heaven, would they want me to make the necessary changes in order to then attain heaven? If, if, if you actually could see in scripture that my family wasn't baptized for the remission of their sins, they didn't live according to the scriptures, they didn't attend worship services, they didn't live a, a holy and righteous life like, it, like I give the examples of Cornelius and, and Saul of Tarsus and the rich young ruler. The rich young ruler said, hey, I, I did all of these things. What else must I do? And then Jesus says, well, sell all your possessions. Come and follow me. And he went away sad, he said. So ask yourself, did our family members who pass on, were they living according to the will of God or were they living according to their own the God of their own lives. Jesus gave an answer to a question. I, 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 I get, I, I'll get you, Robert. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you. The rich man in Lazarus yep. totally helps us with that. Yep. Remember when the rich man says, you know, I, can you send Lazarus back and tell my brothers, I have five brothers who have lived the same life I have. Yep. Can you go back and tell them, what, you know, how not to make the same mistakes that I'm making? And Jesus said, no. Even if you raise somebody from the dead, they're not going to believe it. They have Moses and the prophets. Yeah. Listen to them. 
we cannot change what, what death occurs, and that line has been drawn, you we cannot that. go back and try to reshuffle a deck. Jesus is saying, don't worry about that. You're not going to be struggling with that. Lazarus wasn't struggling with the guy, the rich guy, being in hell. Yeah. He was in Abraham's book. And that's the contentment you would have to live with, that God is going to make sure that you're not going to be worried about who's not there. You're going to be with the people who are. Yeah, we're going to get the Barb and then yeah, Charles sorry, and then Russ. I was Russ. just going to say that um, we're told that in heaven there's no sorrow. Yeah, there's no sorrow. We don't no. understand how that's possible mm -hmm. when we know there's people we want to be next to us there aren't going to be there. How can we possibly not be sorrowful? But we have the faith in God that he's going to take care of it, so we're not. Yeah. Yeah. It bothers us here on earth. Yep. But once we get to heaven, it's not going to. Yeah, it says you'll have no more pain. You'll have no more sorrow. There'll be no more sickness. There'll be no more death. We're not going to be sitting there saying, man, I can't believe Uncle Larry didn't get it. Man, he was one of my favorite uncles. <laughs> I really wish he'd have been here with me. Because if we don't have that, if we don't have that, the, the acknowledgement of that, then who knows? Uh, Charles and then Russ. If we learn to love God, the way we should. Mm -hmm. We love him more than we do any human. Yes. And that is something we in the church have a lot of growing to do. I know I do. Amen. Amen. Russ? I think the very fact that um, many people bring up exactly what Ken just said, and yeah. the fact that people are wrestling with that, and your faith will grow to know that if God can create this world, that yep. can create us, then he can certainly keep us from living a life of sorrow in heaven. Yeah. Uh, he has that power. He's Amen. More powerful than we could ever imagine. Amen. And he has that kind of power to, to help us understand yeah. and to enjoy eternity with him. Yeah, absolutely. You know, we, we also think about, as we, as we think about this topic, you know, and it is an emotional topic, uh, you, you know, for sure, because I think many of us have family members all in the same boat. I would venture to say everybody has friends or family members in the same boat. And that's why at the end of the day, when my dad died, I prayed, and he was Catholic in name only, and I prayed a prayer, and I, sa I said, Lord, please have mercy on his soul. Because I know that I worship and serve a righteous and loving and holy God. And if my righteous and holy and loving God, who always does, his, does what is right, f felt it was right to allow him in, praise be to God. Amen. If he does not, if he was not found worthy to be let in, well then praise be to God. Because... He wasn't worthy to be in, and he didn't live the type of life to be saved. And so we, we know the scriptures. And, and that's why, do we all have a job to do? What is our job as, as brothers and sisters, fellow servants, disciples in the kingdom? What's our one and foremost job? Preach and teach the gospel. And continue to bring it up, to continue to have conversations with our loved ones, with our friends, with our families, with our children, right? Our aunts and uncles, our nieces and nephews have conversations, right? You're here today because people have had conversations with you, right? Everybody has had the opportunity to accept Jesus as their Lord in life. Many of those who are in denominations, do they not have the same Bible that we have? Sure, it might be a different translation, but isn't the New Testament the New Testament? Right? I can pick up any Bible and use the New Testament, no matter what the translation is, to, to show somebody how to, to come to Christ and to teach them the plan of salvation. They had the same Bible. They chose not to read it because they were influenced by, like in my Catholic upbringing, you don't read the Bible. We never read Like here, we got Bibles in the pews. Catholics don't have Bibles in the pews. Well, why not? Because they don't want them reading it for themselves. They want them going to the priest, and the priest, just like I was told all through uh, kindergarten, all the way through my senior year in high school, I went to Catholic schools. If you have questions, you come see the priest, you come see my senior, and we will tell you what you need to know. And so, you know, we, we then do what they, what they tell us to do, and that's what I always did. But it wasn't until I met Christy's family, and her grandfather challenged me, and then he kind of set up some red flags, and I thought to myself, well, why aren't there, um, you know, answers to these questions that, that he asked me? And so that, that's what started me on, the, on a journey of truth. But we all have that opportunity. How many of us, how many of us have heard different teachings from uh, whether, whether it be the Lutherans, whether it be the, the Baptists, whether it be the Catholics, whether it be the Church of God, the Assemblies of God, the Church of Christ? I mean, haven't we heard of all these different ones? And wouldn't a logical person say, if we're all Christians, is it logical to believe that we're all in different paths, but we're going to end up in the same location? 
You're all in, di you're all in different paths, but we're going to end up in the same location. That's, that's not even logical, right, if we're all going in different directions. And so we are responsible for studying to show ourselves approved. How long have you been studying for, Ken, to come to, huh? About a year. About a year. And you've just given your life to Christ. And praise God for that. But it's taken you time, and you've been seeking out the truth. And were you able to find it? Absolutely, right? And so can our family members, and so can our friends. And that's why it's up to us to regularly uh, be to putting, planting seeds uh, into their hearts and minds. Uh, and so hopefully, they may, you might not be the one that gets to water the seed. You may not even see when it comes to fruition. But we pray that it comes to fruition. I don't have a magic answer for you when it comes to that. All I can tell you is we teach the truth, we live out the truth, and we show them what the scripture says about how one is saved. Now, if our loved ones have already departed, there's nothing that we can do for the deceased. When you, when you preach a funeral or when you uh, do a, a, a memorial service, there's literally nothing I could say that could change the eternal destination of the departed soul. Because when they, once they are gone, they're dead and gone, there's nothing that can be said that could change that destination. And so the funerals are for the living. And so many times we'll try to say things uh, in such a manner as it may prick a heart in the family members or friends who came out to mourn the life uh, of, of, the, of the deceased, of their loved one. And so hopefully maybe they, then having a seed planted, will then look to ask some deeper questions. Yeah? I think uh, that is, by knowing the scripture, that is when we pray and ask God to help us with our feelings and yeah. our, um, uh, the troubles that we have. Amen. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. Prayer plays a huge part in it. All right, so we, we continue to look at this. We've looked at uh, Paul. We've looked at the Ethiopian eunuch. We've looked at you know the rich young ruler we talked about. And the issue isn't so much in the sense that uh, have we sinned, it's that we've sinned. In Romans 3 and 23, it says, For all have, uh, all have sinned and come, fall short of the, of the glory of God. And so if, even if one sin constitute a debt that no man, no, that no man can uh, remove or atone for through his own efforts, then we must need a little bit of help. So we look over to the Gospel of Luke in Luke chapter 7. As we look over to Luke chapter 7, and we're going to pick up in verse 36. Luke chapter 7, and we're going to start in verse 36, and we'll go through the end of the chapter. I want you to understand what this says here. Now one of the Pharisees was requesting him to dine with him. And he entered the Pharisee's house, reclined at the table, and behold, there was a woman in the city who was a sinner. And, she was, and as she learned that he was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster vial of perfume. And standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears, and kept wiping them with the hair of her head, and kissing his feet, and anointing them with the perfume. Now when the Pharisee who had invited uh, Jesus saw this, he said to himself, If this man knew, if this man were a prophet, he would have know, he would know who and what sort of person this woman is who is touching him, and that she is a sinner. And then Jesus goes on to give a parable of two debtors. And Jesus answered and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he replied, Say it, teacher. At a certain money, a certain money lender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. And when they were unable to pay, he graciously, he graciously forgave them both. And which, uh, which one of them therefore will love him more? And Simon answered and said, I suppose that the one whom he forgave more. And he said to him, You have, you have judged correctly. And turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered your house, you gave me no water for my feet, but she uh, has wept, uh, wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but she, since the time I came in, has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with perfume. For this reason I say to you, her sins, which are many, have been forgiven, for she loved much. But he who is forgiven little loves little. And he said to her, You, your sins have been forgiven you. And those who were reclining at the table with him began to say to them, Who is this man who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. 
go in peace. Why do I read that passage of scripture when I, when I look at the little comment there? Even one sin constitutes a debt that no man can remove or atone for through his own efforts. What could this woman have done to atone for her own sins in and of herself? Absolutely nothing. But she came to the Son of God, who was still alive, so he was uh, still al she was alive, he was alive. They were living under the Old Covenant. The New Covenant had not yet begun, correct? Did Jesus have the power to not only do miracles, but did he have the power to forgive sins? Yes. Thief on the cross was one of them, was he not? And so, if Jesus had the ability to also do miracles, he wanted to show that he had the ability also to forgive sins. Which is easier, say to arise and pick up your bed, or to say, your sins are forgiving you. And so you know that Jesus had the power to both forgive man and to do miracles here on earth. There is nothing in and of ourselves that we could do that, would be, that we would be able to remove even one sin from our very lives. That's why the individual that we looked at, Cornelius, Saul of Tarsus, the rich young ruler, the Ethiopian eunuch, even though these were good, moral, righteous individuals, they were still outside of Christ. Because at this point, they're living under the New Testament, and we know that the Bible tells us that Jesus says, I am the only way, that, that no one can come unto the Father except through me. And that's where we get to the second uh, half of this uh, lesson, and I think we'll pick it up next week. I know it's uh, quarter to seven. I don't know, what time do you guys want to end? Russ? Seven o'clock. Oh, seven? I, didn't, I wasn't sure exactly uh, when we were ending. You gotta be in bed by nine. You gotta be in bed by nine? Oh, did you come to my house to see the sign? Oh, yeah, you've probably seen it on Tuesdays. Christy has a sign and it says, please leave by 9 p.m. And it's literally right there on the coffee bar. And she's like, no, I'm serious. <laughs> she's usually in bed by 9 30. I think one of the most disturbing things about people that believe that all good moral people are saved is it really discourages evangelism. Yeah. Because if people are lost, are, are saved, why should we teach them? I've said that so many times. Yeah. And, yeah. and if, if people are saved, why should we send missionaries to Africa? If people are saved, we're wasting our money. Yeah. And yet Jesus says, no, you take the word to those people. Yeah. So to me, uh, uh, believing that all good moral people are yeah. saved is the greatest nail in the coffin for evangelism. Yeah. If, if, well, if you can be saved outside of Jesus, and I come to you and teach you the truth now that you're beholden to, I've done you a huge disservice. Amen. Because now I just made it much more difficult Amen. for you to be saved. Amen. Right? But that's not what Jesus said. That's right. What does Mark 16, 15, and 16 say? Let's turn over to Mark 16 real quick. Mark 16, verse 15 and 16. And it says this, Mark 16, 15, and 16. And he said to them, who said to them? Jesus. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. He who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved, but he who has disbelieved shall be condemned. You look at that verse, and you look at that verse in conjunction with 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and about verses 7 through 10, and it's going to tell you something that's very similar, that Jesus was going to come with his angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on two groups of people, those who do not believe and those who have not obeyed. Those who do not believe and those who do have not obeyed. You should not be afraid to preach that. No. Uh, I'm, I'm teaching I'm, the junior high, well, 13, 12, 10, 12, and 10 to 12 year olds. And we go through these things. And I said, this is important. I'm, I'm telling you something, and you're, I'm also putting you in a situation where you know the truth. Mm -hmm. You have to deal with that someday and become, to become a Christian. And they look at me, and I said, yes, this is the truth. They read it in the scriptures. So all of them know in, at one point in their life, they're going to have to confess Christ. And they're yep. going to have to come to Christ. We hide that from them, saying, oh, we we'll wait till he's 26. No, we tell them when they're able to understand. Not Amen. to be able to act, but to understand and be prepared to make a decision about who Jesus is and what they know. Yeah. No excuses. Yep, go ahead. Do 
some of the manuscripts that were, <coughs> that were found were in whole and, and some were in part. And some of the manuscripts do not, ha do not show that verse uh, or that passage in there. So some of the manuscripts that we have in whole, some were in part, and some of them don't have that passage in there. But there's no conflict with what it's saying. But, and yeah, and, I, and, and that's the Matthew, key. Matthew, we can find the same words of Jesus telling us what we should be doing. Yeah. If, if it was something in direct conflict, yeah. that would be a challenge, and that would have been... Yeah. So you, you look at the Gospel of Matthew, you look at Acts chapter 2, you look at Acts chapter 22, you look at Second Peter. Uh, it tells you uh, all of these things are necessary. We could find many passages of Scripture that show us that you have to believe, you have to confess, you have to repent, you have to be baptized, right? You have to go on living faithful. So it's not, we don't just rely on the one, one or two verses there in Mark 16, verse 15 and 16. But I want us to look at a couple things before we shut this down. Let's flip over the page. And now the next question is Jesus. Is Jesus the only way to eternal life? And it's a follow-up to really the questions that we just looked at. And in John chapter 14 and verse 6, if you would like to turn there, turn to Big John chapter 14 and verse 6. Notice what Jesus says. Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life, and no one comes unto the Father but through me. There are some who think that it's very harsh to believe that, that the Bible teaches that there's only one way unto salvation, and that is through Jesus. Because they would say, well, Dave, aren't there many gods? Aren't there many re, uh, world religions? And aren't there many gods in the world? So isn't it a little bit arrogant to say that that your God's the only way unto salvation? And I said, well, d did your God put on flesh and become man and die for the uh, remission of sins and be resurrected on the third day? Was your God uh, recorded on the historical record as performing miracles? And the answer is no. Was your God in heaven from the very beginning? Yeah. Yeah, were you, was your God the one who created all things, like Jesus did? And so you, you look at these questions here. I want you to also look at Acts chapter 4, for, uh, verse 12, real quick. Acts chapter 4, and verse 12, notice what it says. In conjunction with John 14 and 6, where Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes unto the Father except through me. You look at Acts chapter 4, and verse 12, and notice what it says there. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. Must be saved. Is that important? If it says that you have to be, you must be saved in Christ Jesus, can I be saved outside of Christ Jesus? Paul wrote to the Ephesians, there's one. One Lord, one faith. One Lord, yeah. One baptism. Ephesians chapter 4. Absolutely. So, some would ask, but how can a way to uh, but how can a way to salvation be harsh? Well, we should be thankful that God has provided a way unto salvation, versus saying, "Well, that's a little bit harsh, and that's a little bit arrogant to say that there's only one way unto heaven." Would our denominational brothers and sisters like to believe that there's many ways unto heaven? Me and Gina were talking about one this morning after Bible or after worship service, and that was about purgatory, right? The purgatory doctrine is that you weren't good enough to, uh, you weren't bad enough to go right to hell, and you weren't good enough to go right to heaven, and so you go to the a medi a, a, a mediator place or a, or a, a what? Limbo. Uh, like you're in limbo, right? There's a there's a place in between, right? And they call it purgatory, and eventually you have your family members, you have your friends, they say prayers. They pay the church for the Mass of the Dead, and you can give the church money, and they'll have a special Mass on your behalf. And then over a given enough, long enough period of time between paying the church and saying your prayers, eventually you'll leapfrog from purgatory into heaven. Well, if that is the case, well then, there was no need for Jesus Christ to come to this planet to suffer and die. That wasn't why they did it. The Catholic Church did it for one reason. Yeah, for just to raise money. Raise money, yep. Yeah. What do they call the, the, the sin uh, or the, what are they, what they, there's a term for it. Indulgences. They, they were selling indulgences. David, yep. may I make a point? Sure. I think, Paul, all these verses are wonderful. To me, I look at 1 Corinthians 15 where Paul was talking about the resurrection. Yep. And he says it plainly, starting in verse 12. Now, if Christ has preached that he has been raised from the dead, how does some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? Yep. 
But if there is no resurrection of the dead, that is if Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain. Your faith also is in vain. Yeah. Moreover, we are even found to be false witnesses of God because we testified against God that he raised Christ, whom yep. he did not raise. Yeah. If, in fact, the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You are still in your sin. Yeah. Amen. And those who also have fallen asleep in Christ Amen. perish. If we have hope in Christ in this life only, we are of all men most to be pitied. Amen. You, you, you know, you look at these verses, and it makes it just crystal clear. But the problem is, is that oftentimes, many people don't want to hear these verses. And they're not willing to then open up the scriptures to study these things out. I can't tell you how many times before my dad's passing, throughout the years, that I've tried to get him to do a Bible study. He refused. He said, Dave, you have your faith, I have my faith. He never even went to church. He never, never, you know, like maybe a couple times in my whole life, I, you know, maybe on a, like a Christmas Eve mass or something. Uh, he wasn't religious in any way, but he says, you have your faith, I have mine. Mm -hmm. Carrie. Oh, I was going to say a uh, scripture that changed my mind was when um, the disciples were talking to Jesus and they were talking about um, Pilate mixing or mingling the blood yep. with the men. And he said, do you think that these men were worse sinners? And I can't remember the exact verse, but do you think yep. these people are more worse sinners than any other man? And yeah. he said, no, but I tell you, even if you don't repent, the same thing will happen to you. Yeah, amen. You know, she said, uh, do you suppose that these sinners were worse sinners because of what happened to them than any and all? He says, I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. And so you look at the scriptures here. Let's look at one more passage. We're going to close it down. You guys could take this home. I printed it out so you could just have something to take with you. Um, if you want, we could look at the abortion one next week, but it was really just a supplemental thing that I printed for you uh, that you could use for your own personal information. So if you were to have conversations in the coming days or weeks because of what's going on in this country, because of the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the overturn of that Roe versus Wade, then it will give you a little bit of information. There are many other passages of scripture that I could email you. Uh, text you, whatever's easier, if you would like to have that as uh, information as well. But let's look at Matthew chapter 7, and then we're going to close it down after this. Matthew chapter 7. I promise it won't be the whole chapter. <laughs> Matthew chapter 7. And we're going to look at verse uh, 13 and 14. Maybe we'll even go a little further, but Matthew chapter 7. Others will say, before we read that, that it's arrogant to claim, that, as the Bible does, that only one path leads to heaven. And this is what it says in the Gospel of Matthew, verse 13 and 14. Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide, and the way is broad, that leads to destruction, and there are many of those who enter by it. For the gate is small, and the way is narrow, that leads to life, and few are those who find it. What, what would they say about those two verses? They would ignore him. Yeah. You see, we have to, Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Jesus says, why do you call me Lord, Lord in Luke 6 and 46, and yet you don't even do what I ask you to do? And so Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, he had given these uh, writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, James, Paul, so many of them, right? Had given them, by, through the Holy Spirit, everything we need for life and for godliness, what is it, 2 Peter 1 and 3, I believe it says, that everything you need for life and for godliness is contained in the scriptures. Mm -hmm. Everything you need for life and for godliness. It gives us the blueprint to attain heaven. So we, A, have to live by that, but B, more importantly, we need, also need to share it with everybody that we love. If you love your friends and your family and some of your coworkers, why would you not want to share this with as many as that would be willing to listen? You bring up Romans ship. And underneath that verse, it's about changing our minds. It's about renewing our minds <coughs> yep. so that we can prove what the will of God is. And I have written ages ago, uh, underneath that verse, that the carnal mind will approve what the conscience condemns. Yes. And that's what people do. Yes, yes. When they see the truth and they don't want to accept it or believe it, uh, they condemn themselves yep. by going against the conscience that God has placed within each and every one of us. Yeah. If you look right under the uh, number two, the blue writing there with Matthew 7 to 13 to 14 on your handout, listen to what it says right there. 
I believe that is a very, I believe it is a very arrogant claim that one's own sincerity, morality, and good works have in themselves the same moral and eternal weight as the blood of Jesus Christ. That's what they're saying, right? And this is exactly what people are saying when they insist that God will save the good moral person who doesn't become a Christian. They are indeed teaching a salvation based on works of human merit that can, that can in fact, save himself. But we know that the scriptures teach against that. We're going to end it here. Uh, we're going to have a... What's that? We'll have a song and then we'll have a prayer.